excited that you're here with us. So Bill's already in here. He said he is from a sleety Long Island. Yes, we've had some of that kind of freezing rain here. And Donya is very cold in Lawrenceville, Georgia. But Devin, now how is it where you are in New Mexico? Did you guys get any of that really bad storm, that really bad uh, stuff that was hit in Texas? Um, no, I mean, we, we did get snow, but it, it's not to be unexpected. And we're at 7,000 feet in Los Alamos, New Mexico. So we're in the mountains and um, normally we get snowfall and then it, it, it's the ground just doesn't stay very cold. So it'll melt the next day. So it's bad and then it's good and then it's bad and it's good. But incidentally, um, my neighborhood where I used to live in Texas not too long ago, there's lots of people with busted pipes. And I, I'm just heartbroken. Yeah. It, it yeah. was not that long ago that they had Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And it's just like one hit after the other for the folks in Houston. And so my heart goes out to them. And it's not just Houston. It's all over Texas. But. Right. Right. But oh. yeah, Houston has definitely been hit hard. You know, my daughter just like... But in December, just after Christmas, moved from moved out of Dallas back to Tennessee. So, um, yes. So, you know, my heart is broken, but I'm I, I confess to be having some relief to my daughter's not there having to deal true, with this. So, true, true, true. Because yeah, anyway. they're not prepared. I mean, you, no. in Texas, you prepare for heat. You don't prepare for prepare for cold. And so, I I, I get it because I've lived in upstate New York, Iowa, mm -hmm. and now New Mexico. Um, I get it that we make fun of people from Texas, but you know, we living in Cedar Rapids, you cannot handle the heat. So you, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> same here. Same. Yeah. Here in North Carolina, you know, because if it snows, well, just wait a day or two, you know, yeah, for sure. work out that way in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Mary Jane from snowy Pennsylvania. Hey, Phil from Detroit, Catherine from Jessup, Georgia. Hey, Danny from Ohio. Hey, June. Good to see you again. And Flo from Oregon. Well, from Richard, hey, and Bridget, oh, Bridget's up there in Maine, and Pam from Asheville, Ohio. So, yeah, she's freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's freezing. Um, hey, Dave is back again from Renton. Um, yes, I'm noticing I don't see some of my Texas folk um, chiming in. So, yeah, um, they're having yeah. rolling blackouts. So, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I really did because I usually have a number of folks from Texas who chime in, and I was watching it over here. Catherine said it's 81 in Georgia. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you're, be quiet. Yeah, you're, you're way below where, you know. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Hey, Lily from Mississippi, Mile City. Oh, and made it from te East Texas. Welcome. Yay. I'm so glad you made it. Um, I hope you're doing, obviously, you've got power. I hope you're doing well. And hey, Vicki from Florida. So, yeah, so we've got a really great, um, lots of folks in the, in the chat today. If this is your first time joining me um, on a live Facebook or YouTube chat, whichever you're watching, we are some we are streaming simultaneous to both um i want to definitely welcome you feel free to leave comments in the comment section questions that you might have love for you to do that if you're watching on replay you should be able to pick up everything we mentioned in the comments um as well so feel free to um utilize those comments because Devin and i both can see those and you can see those right Devin? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can. Um, yep. so we can go see them and um we can help you guys out if you need anything so welcome welcome for that um i have some announcements to, before we get going and talking with Devin today on writing about writing family history Devin's passionate about that so we have a, i have a big i have a big week around here next week at, for find my past or find my past for are you my cousin guys so on tuesday on the facebook group well and on the youtube channel it'll be live both places I am doing another, it's the third in our series of lives with Jen Baldwin of Find My Past. That is Tuesday, the 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So guys, that's 11 a.m. Eastern time. Yes. Um, <laughs> Jen is going to be talking with us about um, basically crossing the ocean with Catholic records. So she is really going to be um, giving us the lowdown on the Catholic records heritage collection there for at find my past um both certainly they have the american ones records as well as the uk records as well so super excited about that um so you don't want to miss it and if you've missed any um you can head over to the website and you can i've got notes for all and the videos are actually on the the other videos are on the website my website currently now and guys, guess what next week is? <laughs> next week is Roots Tech. 
Guys, it is very different this year. You know, it is virtual. If you have not signed up, go ahead and register, guys. It is free. It is three days, um, the 25th through the 27th. So you definitely want to um, show up and be there. Pretty much everything will be available to watch. So you don't have to, if you can't, if you miss a day or you're working, whatever, you can watch all of the pre-recorded videos that have been done you know, up for like 365 days. So they're going to have all of that available, keynotes, all of that available to watch. So there'll be some portions that you can watch live. Most of it will be um, the um, pre-recorded pre ones. Yes. And they're over, I think, over 800 of these little lectures and videos. They are typically 20 minute lectures as opposed to 60 minute lectures, but there's a lot to watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so feel free to um, definitely sign up and um, register for that. You don't want to miss that. Um, I do have a, t a talk there. I'll, it'll be, I'm talking about, believe it or not, guys, culinary heritage, but you guys know, kind of like to do food things. If you think the ones, the, the, the YouTubes I've done with my daughter, we're kind of into the culinary heritage and food end of things. So we will be, I will be talking about that. Mm -hmm. Another quick thing about that is that for Roots Tech, watch your emails from me next week. Okay. Watch, watch for the, are you my cousin email? Because I will be having two offers for flash on a flash sale during the conference that you do not want to miss. And I'm super excited about them. And you definitely want to watch your emails for that. All right. I saw some things popping up in the comment section over here. June says she had over 21,000 cousins on the roots tech connect. Oh my gosh. Yes. They have that. They have the thing where you can do a, I don't, what do they call it? Cousins Connect or something like that, where mm -hmm. you can um, see who you have that's attending as well, kind of matching those distant cousins. You have to have a tree on Family Search for that to work, but that's kind of a fun thing to do, definitely. Where to watch? Well, let me make a quick clarification. Your oh, yeah. tree is probably on Family Search. You just need to connect yourself to that tree. Probably. <laughs> 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 I'm a little bit fanatical about family search too. So if you have questions yeah. about family search, <laughs> lay them on me. <laughs> true. Um, so somebody had a question. Mary Jane asked about where to watch the lectures from Roots Tech. So just go to rootstech.org on the 25th. So that will be when you can go and they will, the page will, now it looks just like the regular Roots Tech kind of pre-conference stuff, but then they will switch it over to the live conference. So it will just be at rootstech.org will be where you can go to watch those as well. Initially. Yes. You have to have uh, registered in order to watch, do you know? You know, I'm not 100% sure, but I th I'm not <laughs> really sure. That question actually came up in, in, in the talk that I was at recently and I never, I didn't hear the answer. I had to check out a little bit early, but um, I think you actually do have to register to be able to view um, those kinds of things. So, <laughs> but it's free. Like like stock without. <laughs> yeah, but it's free, you know. But once eventually, once everything's over and they put the, I think the, the goal is to put the videos on YouTube eventually, then those, you know, you don't need to register for, you'll be able to see them. So, but yeah, I would encourage. They also have the, the expo hall, which is what I'm really excited about. If you have not ever experienced a virtual conference expo hall. Guys, I encourage you to do that and spend some time with that. I've done it over the past year with some other types of conferences, some travel conferences that I participate in. And it's a really neat experience. It, it's not the same, obviously, but you will have the opportunity to talk to those vendors and to ask their questions and, and get some one-on-one -on -one answers with them. So I would encourage you to make sure you spend some time in the expo hall. That will not be, um, I don't know what they're doing with it, but after the conference, that's going to be less available. Some of it might still be, but for the most part, that won't be quite as registered. Jean said, yes, you need to register at Family Search with the tree. Oh yeah, for you it's free. Yeah. So the family search tree. Yeah. Register with family search. Yes. Yeah. To make that connection thing work. Yeah. To make the connection thing work. Yes. Yes, you do. And Pam said, yes, you have to register to watch. I was thinking you did because that question actually came up. All right. So that's the big week next week around here, guys. So early in the week, find my past. Jen Baldwin and I will be talking about Catholic heritage records. And then we go into Roots Tech very soon after that. So look forward to seeing you guys there. Um, also during Roots Tech, guys, I will be showing up every 
every day, well, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at around 11-ish in the morning to chat about just kind of what I'm seeing, what tips that might help you work your way through it as I go through it to see, you know, I just want to share some tips if, if I see things that are working. And um, I forgot to turn my phone off. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> One thing I forgot to do, got to turn that phone off. All right, let's get on with today's topic, Devin. <laughs> so, All right. Devin, as you guys know, loves to write. She's a fantastic writer, loves, is so incredibly passionate about writing about family history. Yeah. And, and, and because it's so important to get what we find, you know, we find all these records, but then we never really get it out there sometimes for other people. Mm -hmm. So she wants to tell us about this. It's a challenge that started with um, a Southern you, California genealogy. Yeah. Yeah. As part of yeah. Yep. So yeah, I'd be happy to tell you a little bit about it. So, um, so the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree is, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that it is my favorite conference. It is the fun conference. So Rutech is the big conference. Southern California is the fun conference. And um, earlier this year, I did a free webinar and uh, Lisa Lilson will have the links to my blog post where you can find out about some of the things I'm gonna be talking about. Anyway, so I did a free uh, webinar with them because they have a book that's coming out in June and it is going to be a compilation of user uh, submissions of articles about ancestors that are 600 words or less. Now, when I uh, was pitched the idea of teaching people how to do a 600 word or less essay, at first I thought, well, that's gonna be so hard because I have so much. And then yeah. I came up with some stories from like, oh, that's gonna be so hard. How do I make it go to 600 words? Cause I only had 300. <laughs> and so in that webinar, I taught you teach four different strategies to write a article about your ancestor that would fit the guidelines for Southern California Jamboree. Now, you do not have to be a member of Southern California Jamboree to submit your article and have it included into the book. The catch is you've got to get it in as soon as possible, and, but the deadline is March 15th. So they're accepting entries that um, are first come, first serve. And if you've ever wanted to challenge yourself to write a story, 600 words is an easy by side story to write. And if you've ever wanted to be published, but you didn't want to go through all the editing stuff, we'll let Southern California do that for you. And then you can have that copy that you can share with others. And what's really, really great is it's compilation. And so you're going to see all these little short stories that people submit from around the world. And we're going to find out that our ancestors are not so different from each other after all, and yet they're pretty special because they're ours. And so that's what I'm really grateful to be partnering with them to help promote and invite people to write a story if they haven't before. And then I know June in the chat sent me an email earlier that she's already submitted her stories. And so I'm really proud of you. Yay. So if you have submitted, good job. If you haven't, then let's talk a little bit about that. And then I definitely want you to go over and watch that free it is free yes. webinar that um and you'll find the links to everything did you drop a link to it already I dropped the link to your post i'll drop a link to that free webinar too i, I did want to say one of the things that i absolutely love that you just said is that you know our ancestors are special while because they're so special simply because they're our ancestors so oftentimes we hear but you know Oh, but my ancestors really didn't do anything or they did, you know, they were just farmers or, or, or whatever. And, you know, we don't need, we don't need that famous ancestor in yeah. order to have a special ancestor to tell their story. Cause I'm very passionate that that's the story. Yeah. That right. The story. You know, so, and so I have a blog post over on my website, familyhistoryfanatics.com. And you can type in boring ancestor into the search bar and you're going to find articles about how to write about a boring ancestor and how to write, not write a boring story. And you'd be surprised. Some of our Okay, so my favorite success story was I teach a simple recipe for writing family histories mm -hmm. and it, 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 it goes into the document. So if you want to be a better genealogist, you learn to write stories about your ancestors because you're going to find things that you thought you had or thought you understood and all of a sudden go, oh, I didn't actually have that after all. 
And not only that, write in a write to a general audience rather than an academic paper. Don't write to try to get a CG or an AG certification. There's a time and place for that. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not criticizing that, but you really develop your skills when you try to think who were they were, what were their uh, world like, and those farmers. If we didn't have farmers, we wouldn't eat. And so regardless of how boring you think they are, you're going to discover that their life really wasn't as boring as you thought it was. They just handle it in a different way than you would. And that's a, the foundation upon we have our heritage and our our um, psyche, I guess. <laughs> that's not the word I'm looking for, but something in that that direction. That That's kind of our, our legacy and who we were built on. And we need to be thankful for the farmers, the murderers, and the drunks. You know, I'm related to a, a phys physicist. He taught physics. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> so all I know, I would say, I would say he was a professor. I was, I'm related to a professor, a milkman, and a drunk, and I love mm -hmm. them all. Yep. So all of them just sort just deserve to be written about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I think sometimes the. I guess what sometimes people would consider the boring ones or the, the but the, you know, the ones who were less flamboyant, maybe perhaps in, on the, well, who were not famous, the, the farmers and that, you know, just the kind of average, average person kind of living their life to me were really, um, that's where some of the really good stories are. Yes. For, for sure. And um, there's a lot of color in those. And I think that might be how I got into just really being fascinated by female ancestors because you know, these women in my family and your family and every, they, they were living such what I call out loud lives, but they were at such a, in the community, they weren't, you know, they weren't famous, but what they were doing was really pretty incredible stuff. You know, everything from the woman who, you know, didn't marry the man that she loved because he was a gambler. So she did it on her own terms and they just had a relationship and marry, you know, and a children and a whole bit. Right. But just never married, you know, those kinds of things I think are pretty, pretty so, yeah. I don't know if you, I don't know how many people like U.S. country music from like the 90s. There was um, a song, I believe it was, I've written about it on my on my blog called Writing the Story of Ordinary People and Why Their Stories Need to Matter. Mm -hmm. And there was a song and, and I'm, I'm blanking, I'm going to actually have to search it and I'll tell you in a second. But um, it was a song called Ordinary, the, um, ordinary people live in extraordinary lives and my greatest wish is to live an ordinary life like you and mm -hmm. it's a powerful song that talks about how those ordinary people are just pretty amazing and um i advocate i mean it's fun to have a vampire in your family tree my husband is fortunate enough to have a vampire in his family oh, tree cool. <laughs> and i i really should say a vampire but um <laughs> but I'm just so grateful for the people who've come before me. I'm grateful for, and so over on my blog, um, there is a story about my dad and how my dad became my hero. But unfortunately, like the Reba McIntyre song that said the greatest man I never knew lived just down the hall, that was my dad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And family history and writing stories and asking questions led me to heal and discover he wasn't so bad after all. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds like, cause you should have known that growing up. Well, he wasn't an easy man to love. He was, he, he, he had residual effects of uh, conquering alcoholism, but not doing it with a therapist. And so he had all these other little dragons that I didn't know about um, yeah. or note that I saw, but I didn't know he slayed the big dragon of generational alcoholism. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of healing that happens when we write our stories, but there's also, you know, I remember being a young mother and having absolutely no domestic goddess skills. I mean, I didn't even have domestic princess skills. I wasn't even good enough to be the chambermaid when I got started being a mom. Oh my and I would have loved to have stories about my mothers, you know, like you talk about mm -hmm. the females, my mothers, what did they do? And, and how did they feel? And were they, did they feel like they were equipped? And, you know, they did the very best they can. And I would have loved to have read the stories of mm -hmm. them. So it's, it falls upon me now that my mom and my grandparents and my great grandparents, everybody's deceased except for me, that I need to start writing those stories. So if you're fortunate and you still have living relatives, you got to get those stories written because yeah. there's people who want to hear that story. Yeah. And I think it changes perspectives too, because what you either lived or the stories that you, if you heard the stories as a child, 
you know, when you hear those stories, you find, go in and find out what actually, why things are actually were the way they were, you get a difference in perspective um, with ancestors and mm -hmm. just, you know, you, you start to understand. And that's actually crucial for research and stuff. So we have a couple of questions okay. in, the, in the chat. And then I want to get back into like maybe how how to get started. Okay, great. Stuff. But um, Catherine said at the, at the beginning, she said, do you suggest a publisher program that allows you to write a story and include, or that lets you integrate photos and documents with your writing? Do you have any particular, <laughs> I know what I do. I'm curious of what you do. Well, tell me what you do and then I'll add to it. Google Drive works really well for me. <laughs> Google Drive works really well. Yeah, Google okay, so I'll, just, I'll just word process basically. Yes. And um, so there are so many programs out there. You could use a journaling app to write your thoughts. You can use a blog to write your thoughts and your stories. Um, I personally draft in Google and I format in Microsoft Office or LibreOffice, OpenOffice. And instead of using Scrivener or InDesign or Microsoft Publisher, now I have a background in desktop publishing because I used to do this with my mother's pageant um, news service. And I just find that you don't really need to go through all of that to tell a great story. The thing mm -hmm. you need to do is get the story written. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you wanna take the time and utilize the, the fancy programs, go for it. But there's so much you can get done in Microsoft and Apple Pages and LibreOffice that I would write it there. But definitely for drafting, I use Google Docs including pictures, heck to the yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it's free and it's, for me, I mean, you know, back when we were traveling and stuff, you know, I could get it offline on my tablet. Guys, do you, I can't tell you back before we couldn't travel anymore, how many, how many blog posts that I actually wrote while sitting on an airplane? There you go. Who knew I could, act, and I wrote them in Drive, you know, or I wrote them in Google Sheets, but yeah. For sure. um, I just, and I just love the, because I like tech, Mm -hmm. I get too caught up in all the techie things like on a scrivener or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I go down those rabbit holes and then I don't get anything written. So. Right. For yeah. sure. For yeah, sure. But then back to the point of the pictures. Yes. You know, incorporate pictures, incorporate pictures of people, places, things, headlines, artifacts, anything to help tell a story because the people that are coming after aren't going to know what a bobsled in Canada in 1850 is. Mm -hmm. You tell me okay this is me when you talk about a bobsled i think of the winter bobsled going down the little tubey things mm -hmm. i didn't realize it it's when you take a um, horse-drawn wagon and in the winter you switch out the wheels with the sleighs on springs and so it bobs and now you have a bobsled but somebody oh. finally showed me a picture and i'm like oh, okay i feel like a dork I didn't, but, so yeah. don't, <laughs> there you go, you know, um, so we would call that a sleigh, right? Right. But in Canada, they called it a bobsled. And because you, we don't understand those different things, throwing in a picture solves it, solves that for your reader very quickly. They can connect. So you don't have to use family photos. And I know, Lisa, you have blog posts about um, finding photos when your family mm -hmm. doesn't have photos. I even interviewed for my YouTube channel about yeah. that. And um, you can use a lot of those. You can use headlines from newspapers, whether they name your actual ancestor or they mm -hmm. talk about events that take place in your ancestor lives. You can really jazz things up quite a bit and make that story come alive, both visually and with words. So definitely include it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, uh -oh, looks like somebody's got. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we, we just keep something. Oh, <laughs> she's got a hiccup up. going on. Yeah. Oh, I know it keeps something keeps. Okay. Oh, no, I don't know what, I don't know why that's doing that guys. I've not ever seen that happen before. I think it'll stop. Um, okay. Um, so back to the, why is it still, I don't, can I make okay. it stop? Arlie, I think you need to lo um, log out and come back in to get that to stop sweetie. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's trying to log off and it just keeps going on. Um, so Devin, can you give us some good, like very first steps? And we've kind of kind of gone over, but can you bring it kind of narrow down? I'm gonna head over to the Facebook page and see if I can get, yeah, get uh, that early thing to stop. And um, <laughs> if 
you can start sure. off a little bit about how to get started. Some good for sure. Stuff. For sure. Okay. So how do you get started? Well, it depends on what's floating around in your head. So I've taught a lot of workshops and a lot of people will start trying to write a story using the method that I teach and then go, you know what, but I know this story about my grandma or I have these pictures of my uncle. Okay, so if you are fortunate enough to have memories, to have stories that you know, your number one priority is to get those out of your head and get them written down somewhere. Why? Because I don't mean to be morbid, but this is how I think. What happens if I die tomorrow? Those stories go into the ground with me. So your number one priority is to get the perishable knowledge out of your head and get it recorded. So go get pictures. This is like the easiest way to write. Go get pictures that you have memories of or you know the person and where they are and what they're doing and turn that into a sentence. So I actually have a sample over um, part of that a challenge with the Southern California Jamboree is a writing style called a photo essay. And it tells you how to do that in the lecture. And then there's a sample over my blog. Um, so go and give your photos stories so that the, you capture that perishable stuff. That's, that's the easiest thing you can do. And that's the first thing you should do. Now, if you've done that, or if that doesn't excite you, or you're not fortunate enough to have those stories and memories, then you go get a document. Start with documents, the more recent documents, and then work your way to the past because the past have fewer details than the more modern ones and start extracting everything. So it's like transcribing, but instead of a straight transcription, turn it into a reader friendly sentence or two. So you could, you know, Doctor, you know, birth certificate 1052132, name of resident. But you know, it's really a transcription is is great in genealogy, don't get me wrong. But a reader wants you to know on this day, this person was born to this couple in this location, and they normally lived here, and the father was a this and a mother was a that. They were one of two, you know, they were twins or not twins, you know. There's so many details in these records, just turn it into a sentence and you have the foundation of a first story. That sounds good. Okay, I think I got our thing taken care of, guys. Sorry, it took, awesome. me, a minute, took me a minute to figure out how to get that done, but I think I got that everything taken care of. Um, yeah, so <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I think that's such the hard part and forgive me if I repeat a little bit as I was, no, watching, I was listening with half an ear there. Um, but yeah, to be able just to get started and just to be able to, I think sometimes we get over, we just have to get over as though we're, you know, we stare at that blank page paper and you're just like, ah, where do you yeah. start? And, 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 and the, just, the easiest way to get over writer's block because writer's block doesn't exist. Writer's block happens when you don't have any source material mm -hmm. or you haven't put the stupid sentence down. And when I say stupid, it's to keep it simple, stupid. Not mm -hmm. that you are stupid, just keep things simple. So when you need to start writing and you're facing a blank screen, put on your screen, Laura Maud Smith was born on this date and this place to these people. Now you're over writer's block. And so now tell us, how do you know it? What was going on in the world? Who were her other relatives? And just fill in the details and you're off to the races. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Sometimes I'll just kind of write that sentence that I know that I'm probably going to delete later. <laughs> but I'm always interested in where, where the writing takes out. So like, if I don't really know where to start, like you said, if, you know, I take the comment and I want to, you know, I was in my head want it to sound all wonderful and, you know, easy uh -huh. to move and, and, you know, that's not how I write, you know, I, so I, I just sit there, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to write. And if I delete it all, I delete it all. But I'm just, okay. I just, I'm just going to write. Now I never ever delete it all, but, but <laughs> okay. it's of knowing that I have the, you know, knowing that I can do that and the world right. will still spin. <laughs> Okay, now I need to talk to that inner voice of yours because uh -oh. people in the chat probably already have it. The problem with us when we get stopped and we're like, we want it to sound a certain way, you're going to take that voice not uh, that voice police and the grammar police and you're going to send them to timeout until mm -hmm. your first draft is done because you cannot make a great story until you've written that terrible first draft. I think like, all first drafts are awful. 
But the goal of a first draft is not to make it great. The goal of the first draft is to get it done. Yes. And yes. then you can make it better. And then once you see that story, because far too many, I love them. And they're great for your second draft writing educators in the family history space. Mm -hmm. When I went learning, trying to find out how I can write my stories and write them quickly, very few people were talking about that first draft. And ignore your audience, ignore the final product, just get the story written because often you think you know a certain story about your ancestor, but until you go into the records, until you jazz it up with historical content, you don't really know the story you think you know. Mm -hmm. And so that once you have written your first draft, then you can go get the really cool techniques and the advanced techniques that others teach. And then I do teach people how to in, enhance their stories. But your number one goal is to get the stuff processed mm -hmm. and then see what you have. And then you can worry about what voice and what format and who is it for. And should it be a children's book? Should it be, you know, a traditional mm -hmm. academic style? All of that comes when you start editing. That's, I mean, that's <laughs> Sorry, that's my soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> but it's such a great thing because, you know, in my head for so long, you know, I thought, oh, gosh, I've got some English. My English teachers are out there probably just going, I can't believe she make, you know, she's writing all this stuff. And she's because, you know, guys, there are a few things that I did not like in high school. I hated writing. I hated and I hated history and I hated public speaking. And oh. so there's probably a few teachers out there who are going, what is she doing now? And I had but I had to get over the fact that I didn't have to write like they wanted me to write. Anybody reads the blog knows that I write like I talk, which is I like to call it Southern. But anyway, um, you know, and that's why you'll find things that sound a little different or, you know, I know misspelled words or, you know, whatever, because I write like I talk. And so, yeah, we have a lot of comments that are flying through here. I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay. I just have to say, writers of the world unite, untie instead of unite. Yes, yes, exactly. I love that shirt. <laughs> I know, I know. Writers say you're writing history, yeah. So let me say this other thing that I, I frequently tell people. Mm -hmm. A perfectly crafted story stuck in your head does nobody any good. At a flaw, a grammatically flawed story that is available for others to read and edit and improve is far better. So okay. get the poorly written Southern voice or Texas slang, get it out of your head and get it somewhere because that's far better than it's stuck in your head, perfectly crafted mm -hmm. to make your English teacher's heart sing. Now, some people are English teachers oh, and yeah, they yeah. love you. And we, I know, because I've had people in my writing course who are English teachers and they get really irritated when their first draft that they, it's not perfect. <laughs> Again, take that inner side of you and tell them to go to the corner. You'll see, welcome, they are perfect for the editing phase. Yes. They're not perfect for the drafting phase. And so most people say they can't write. That's because your, your critic is not where they're supposed to be. Yes. So let's get to these questions. Some of these are really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. So Barbie said, do you add do do you add the stories to ancestry as well for all of your ancestors? Okay. It all depends on what I'm trying to accomplish with my stories. So I actually don't put a lot of my stories on ancestry, partly because ancestry can go away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds awful. Um so I prefer to put my my stories over on Family Search because Family Search it has been backed by an organization that's been around since 1894. Now that doesn't mean it's online since 1894, but they're in the business of preserving our stories. So in the past, we used to ship stuff off to the Family History Library, and they would put that in the Granite Mountain Vault. But now we can put our stories and our memories and all that stuff onto Family Search, and they're constantly. This is their passion. This is their mission. They're going to be around, and they're going to keep it from going obsolete. So I prefer to put my stories over on Family Search. The other thing I prefer to do is, can you see? Okay. Well, that's my memoir that I wrote over there, and then over on the side, I have two books. Um, the, I've written a hundred about 120 ancestors, their first draft. So now I can spend the rest of my life making them good enough to publish. And I have two published on my grandfather who died when I was two, and my German immigrant ancestor who bought the bought himself and founded the Geislers in Columbus, Ohio. And so I print those out because I can give those a gift to all of my family members. So 
Yeah, that's you great. You could put them on Ancestry. Don't get me wrong. You can put them on yeah, Ancestry. Yeah. That You ask me what I do. That's what I do. And those are the reasons why I do those things. Oh, and, and the other reason why I print them out is you can submit those to libraries. Mm -hmm. And many people are thinking, oh, what do I do with my research when I'm done? Well, not every library has space for a vertical file in all of our binders. But, a, you know, a book that's about that size, a lot of places will take that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, because Kathy asked about WikiTree. And I think it's, I think really any any of these sites that are out there, like an Ancestry or WikiTree, you know, any of the genealogy sites, <laughs> they you know, they could go away tomorrow. You you know, when you put it on there, that's gr that's fine and that's great. And other people can use it mm -hmm. perhaps for research, but you know, it's the internet and what happens when, if they, if that company goes away or right. whatever is, is happening. So yeah, I mean, I might put some on Ancestry. Usually mm -hmm. it tends to be ones I'm actively researching that maybe I'm working with a partner on or I'm trying to get a little more out there. But mm -hmm. I think like everybody, I have a lot of some of those stories that I have written down that are actually not things that necessarily I want out in the public light right now, because perhaps there's still people living, you know, older relatives that might be uncomfortable with some of those stories out there, but I right. want to preserve them. So I actually keep them, you know, in my own, just, I just don't sync them. I keep them in my own, um, I use Family Tree Maker, so I keep them in my software, but I also keep them backed up in a couple other places as well. I'll probably print them out. I probably have a Google Doc drive of them as well. Just it, just like photographs, I make sure I've got them in like three different forms so that if any right. one of those fails, I still got the story. Well, um, and I, I grew up in the Hurricane Alley and then I moved to Tornado Alley. So it's good to have it in different locations. Don't just keep them all in Houston. <laughs> you need them in lots of different places. Yeah, so that's good. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Uh, let's see. What else did I see? Oh, Amy said her grandkids, her kids call her the, the, gram, the grammar Nazi. Yes. <laughs> My daughter was. Well, I was afraid to use that word because uh, that word has not been well i've i've been called that mm. recently and so i try to stay away from the word but i i know what you're saying <laughs> yeah my daughter is very particular about her about grammar and stuff they always get me definitely um <laughs> oh juliana that was too sweet of you she said we we're two of her favorite genealogy ladies oh. that's so sweet barbie says she has three family history books three history books with family history for both her parents side that's great that you're going to keep on writing them yes keep writing in the future definitely um, let me see. Oh, so, okay, you mentioned a new memory section on family search and my heritage or fun tools and to aid in your storytelling. Yes, I have not played with those as much as I want to, but definitely wanted to to think about that as well. So if you have short stories like 600 words or less, you mm -hmm. can put those in the memory section as a story over on family search. Okay. And then if you have a longer one, a multiple PDF page item, then you can put that, upload it as a document. And here's the really slick thing is you can tag everybody that you talk about in the family search family tree and you upload that document once and then tag everybody. And then the story shows up in everybody's little memory section, which is kind of nice. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah that, is <laughs> that is definitely a very nice thing. Um, Amy says she uses family tree maker to print from it, yes, yes, I print from it to make a backup copy for the trees. Um, There's a comment the, the, the from story. Kathy. Did you what? See? There's a comment from Kathy Mulligan Wiseman. Uh huh. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. I've been thinking about writing about my grandmother and take the fact that she never wanted to talk about the past, even though she was the one who took all the pictures and cut out all the articles of the newspaper. You need to write her story. And, but be careful, right? I want you to articulate that she never wanted to talk to past. And if you discover some of the reasons why she might not have wanted to talk about the past, then I want you to be think, put on a classically trained journalism cap and give the facts, but don't tell the readers what to think. Let them decide, oh, that's probably why she didn't talk about the fact. You, you see what I'm saying? You offer the facts of her life, mention that she didn't like to talk about it, and let the reader draw their own conclusion. But that would be a really, really good story mm. uh, to share. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. 
oh, I keep, all, I've gotten all these ideas now. It's like, as we keep talking, I'm like, okay, I need to write this story and that story. You've got all these stories running through my head now, Devin. <laughs> 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 I need to write in places I need to research and, right. you know. Then, well, let me give you a couple other tips. So many yeah. people, I have, don't have time to write. Well, you also don't have time not to write. Oh, <laughs> but make a date with yourself mm -hmm. and set a timer. And but you know, get your material organized either in an online tree, in your binders, in your data, um, genealogy software like Family Tree Maker, and then sit down for a specified time and spend time writing about your ancestors. And when the timer goes off, just stop. You know, just stop. Well, mm -hmm. try to give yourself like five minutes. Like you're going to write for 30 and then you're going to take that last five minutes and kind of mark down all that, you know, not full citations, but at least mini citations. Do you remember what rock documents mm -hmm. you looked at so that you can come back during editing and finish out your citation and, and continue up from there. So you write for 30 minutes, five minutes to make note of where you did your citations or do a footnote citation in Google Docs, which is my favorite way to do things mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when I'm writing, when I'm drafting. And then your next session can either be a citation session or another writing session, but just make a date with yourself and, and get into your records. It'll be really fun. Yeah, I, that's a great idea. That's absolutely, yeah. The timer is a huge thing. I have a timer that I use when I'm writing, whether it's blog posts or, or my ancestors or researching or whatever, because it's so easy to get, you know, mm -hmm. dinner's pizza again tonight or something like that. <laughs> I don't have a timer going for myself. For sure. So. For sure. Yeah. So do you have some last, what's the last thing if we, if you want everybody, if you want people to walk away and remember one thing from what we've talked about, what would that be? Write your stories. <laughs> Preserve, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, perishable. Um, you know, the documents will be there and somebody can write the stories based on documents in the future, but they can't capture those perishable moments. those stories that you know, the reason that my dad was a roadie for the rock band, the rebounds in the 1960s, who the heck is Moose? So if you want to hear about the story of Moose and my mom dating, that it's over on my um, blog post. It's the story, the memory snippet that mm -hmm. I wrote for the webinar for Southern California Jamboree. But I, I can't find out from her what who was Moose, what did he look like, what is his real name. My other story that I would give anything to know is my dad, he wanted to serve in the Vietnam War with four other bu buddies. So there was five guys who went to the Vietnam War to enlist. Now, mm -hmm. the fifth one didn't want to go. But since his buddies were going, he went. Can you mm -hmm. tell where the story is going? I think so. My father was rejected because he had bad hearing. I was a little bit over. No, he was skinny at the time. Actually, he was skinny, which was which odd because his grand, his father was rejected from World War II because he was too heavy, which is kind of another story. But anyway, so my dad was rejected for his hearing. The three other guys who really wanted to go all had something that they were rejected for. And the fifth guy who went because the four guys were going, he went and served. Wow. When you enlist, you have to go, right? Right. I have no idea what that man's name is. I have no idea what happened to him. Mm -hmm. I would give anything to know those things. But you've got stories that you know that people are going to give anything to hear about, even the tiniest of details. I had one young man come to a workshop of mine. He's like, I don't remember anything about my grandpa except for the fact that he would share his grapes with me. I would sit on his lap and share grapes. And I'm like, I never did that with my grandfather. Like, that's the coolest thing ever. My, the only thing I remember about my grandpa was that he had these penny jars, these glass penny oh, uh -huh. jars, right, from World yeah. War II. And he smoked pipe tobacco, and I hated the smell of pipe tobacco, <laughs> coffee. Those are two worst smells together in my life. And he had, um, he was a hunter, and so there was animal trophies all over his house. That's all I remember. I don't remember him interacting with me. Mm -hmm. So even the smallest of, of smallest of details tells you that grandpa loved that grandson, right? Right. So not to say that my grandpa didn't love me, but there's a tangible proof of it. Mm -hmm. And so capture those stories. So if anything, take time and start writing your memories down. Now, if you can't write them, get a device and talk them. 
And there's lots of ways that you can transcribe your audio later. We don't have time to get into it. But if you can't write it, talk it. Yes. But do something to capture those perishable stories. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Devin. I appreciate that. You guys, the link for the um, write, your, write about the stars in your family contest, or not contest, but to be challenged. Challenge. It's like a, the Southern California Jamboree Challenge is in the comments. And you know what? Let me just drop that in one more time. I think For we'll sure. Go. For okay. sure. And I'll screen share and tell you what it looks like. Oh, if okay. Because yeah. the blue I'm one, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm playing with StreamYard. You've got me convinced to do StreamYard. Oh, there's oh, my screen. Screen. I have to switch the layout. Do you know how uh, to do that? What she's referring to, guys, StreamYard, that is the. Um, it is the software that I use for, um, oh, I have to add it to the thing. It's, yeah, the, software, it's the software that I use for um, streaming simultaneously to Facebook and YouTube at the same yeah. time. So what you're doing is when you come here, you're looking for the 2020 Genealogy Challenge, writing about the stars of your family tree. And just as I said before, the deadline is March 15th to get your stories submitted. And um, if you need any help, then you can come to my Facebook group, Family History Fanatics Community, and we're talking about writing a lot this month. So you could submit your story and say, hey, I need help. And we'll take care of you there. And this is the details. And these are the samples that I was talking about, the brief biological, a biographical sketch and twist on a biographical sketch, the photo essay and the memory snippets. That's about Moose. So if you want to hear about the story of Moose and the rebounds, then it's right in there. And then if you are a crier, before you read the story about my dad as my hero, go get your tissues. So I invite you to check those out and I and leave comments or ask questions and get a hold of me. I, I love talking about writing when Lisa said, Let's, what do you want to talk about? I'm like, um, writing. <laughs> so I'm here for you to help you get your stories to the finish line. Wonderful. Yay. Well, thanks so much, Devin. I appreciate it. And guys, I will see you next week. Don't forget, Tuesday, February 23rd, 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'll let you guys do the math. Um, and for Jen Baldwin to be here from Find My Past. And then Roots Tech starts next week. I will not have a formal, um, a, a regular Thursday Facebook Live um, because of Roots Tech next week. Um, but watch your email because I will have all the kind of information of where to find me during Roots Tech online and all that good stuff. So I look forward to talking to you guys later. Bye guys. Bye guys. Have a good one.